Buendia Humanoids. Um, another great book for you, The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. Um, thoughts on the nature of mass movements. This was such an interesting book, like so insightful. Um, this could totally apply to any of those um, influencers out there. If you're trying to, you know, get people behind you and try and get that you want them to care about what you're doing and your message, this book would help you achieve that much, much more quickly and more effectively and get people to engage and, and take action, which I know is, is one of the harder parts of, you know, getting people behind, you know, whether it's your music or your, your, you know, Instagram page or whatever your theme is. It's hard to get people to take action, but True Believer would help you kind of get that moving quicker. Um, he talks about anything, everything from, you know, Hitler and Mussolini and, and Martin Luther King and Jesus and like whatever the great leader, there were certain things in common with each of them um, that kind of, you know, touched on people's frustration, anger, or uncomfortability and got them to move in the direction of the leader that, that they wanted, right? And so it was uh, extremely interesting to sort of break down just the various things in my life, um, whether it's Facebook stuff or religion or whatever, and, and kind of take this in, in, um, in that context. Um, as usually, as usual, I'll read a few quotes and kind of break them down. But he, he, in the beginning, he talks about that it's like frustration has to be present for people to want to really jump on board with some leader. And that leader's got to have some sort of charismatic, um, you know, it's usually a, a person of words, right? It's usually some great speaker. So sometimes they're not all, even all that logical they're a great speaker and they're passionate and they personally believe it and they portray that belief to the to the people and and essentially touch on someone's frustration and that frustration can stem from a lot of different things but they hit on that frustration and then offer their the solution or the movement towards the solution right so that frustration of itself without any proselytizing prom prompting from the outside can generate most of the peculiar characteristics of the true believer that an effective technique of con conversion consists basically in the inculcation and fixation of procliv proclivities and responses um, indigenous to the frustrated mind. I can't read, but it was deep, right? It's, it's interesting. You, you take into the, you, you get in, tap into someone's frustration and, uh, and then offer that solution to, you know, to relieve them of their frustration and they immediately take action. He says, this discontent by itself does not invariably create a desire for change. Other factors have to be present before discontent turns into disaffection. One of these is a sense of power. Those who are awed by their surroundings do not think of change no matter how miserable their condition. When our mode of life is so precarious as to make it uh, patent that we cannot control the circumstances of, of our existence, we tend to stick to the proven and the familiar. We counteract a deep feeling of insecurity by making of our existence a fixed routine. We hereby acquire the illusion that we have tamed the unpredictable. We all have certain things in our lives, patterns that we think are predictable. They seem predictable. Today, I'm, you know, tomorrow is Monday. I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna open up my laptop, check my emails and, and get to work, right? And it seems like that should happen. Probably will, has a lot of times, many weeks in a row. Um, uh, you know, we get used to our family being around or, or our friends or whatever. And so there's certain things that are predictable. Traffic's always about the same, right? The weather's always about the same. Stock market, always about the same. The la like, you know, the next 20 years are gonna be about the same as the last 20. Certain, you know, uh, comfortability in, in knowing that, that that's secure, but there is always a chance that those things won't happen. We just kind of forget that that's a chance, right? Um, and so when something kind of provokes us to, to think that it's 
going to change or that we're powerless, then we start going, wait a second, I got to take action to make sure that it does stay the same or that I have power in my own future, my own life. Um, and sometimes he gets into this pretty deep in, in other chapters where um, people would actually rather be in some ways enslaved or, uh, you know, give up their freedom of choice, you know, to varying degrees on different issues in order to free themselves of the personal responsibility of potential failure. So if it's like we the group have to succeed or fail together, I'm less responsible for my own success or failures, that feels better, right? Rather than the individual just saying, I make it or I suffer based on my own, you know, desire, my own will, my own ability to get up and then go, right? That can seem really daunting to some people, so they would rather give up certain freedom to be a part of a group and a mass movement. Uh, I think I thought that was really interesting, and he actually had, I, th I think he had a percentage, and the percentage of people that would rather be that individual living and dying by their own abilities was quite small, like smaller than, I, than you would think. Um, the representation on the front of the book is Hitler and everyone's saluting him, right? And so it's like, how did he, I mean, a lot of people have wondered, you know, and there's a lot of studies done on that, but how did he get so many normal people, at least seemingly, right, um, to follow him to such severe degrees of, of you know, disturbing acts? And, and a lot of it has to do with that, right? Like, I have no control of my life, but, but he does. And if I'm on that side, at least me and my family are taken care of. That feels way better than standing alone against such a um, scary environment. Even if it was, didn't have to do with, you know, the military, but just that there was a lack of food and resources for a lot of people, and and you wanted to be on the side that had them, <laughs> All right? So um, certain things will push people into into a direction that uh, normally you wouldn't think possible. What seems to count more than possession of instruments of power is faith in the future. Where power is not joined with faith in the future it is used mainly to ward off the new and, pre and preserve the status quo. On the other hand, extravagant hope, even when not backed by actual power, is likely to generate a most reckless daring. For the hopeful can draw strength from the most ridiculous sources of power, a slogan, a word, a button. He says it must also claim to be a key to the book of the future. A slogan, a key, a button, a word, a button. Um, if people can sense that there's some, if they can get a sense of power from being on that team, that slogan, that, you know, whatever, um, they're much more likely to move, especially if they live in, an, in, a, they're in a current state of, of frustration, poverty, whatever it is but not a constant state of poverty. If it's generational poverty, that's not enough to motivate people, but if it's new poverty, and that's, you know, they've recently lost great possession and now they're poor, and they feel out of control and out of place and uncomfortable, then they're willing to move if you can offer a solution. A mass movement attracts and holds a following not because it can satisfy the desire for self-advancement, but because it can satisfy the passion for self renunciation it's kind of what I was touching on before if you can you know give up some of your personal responsibility and gain power or at least perceived power then you know then then people are on board I thought this was really interesting in like thinking of my own political views or or ties or you know desires and and like political discussions with people, they, they frequently get heated about one specific topic as if it's, you know, 100% correct or incorrect. And usually if you get to know any topic really well, it becomes more and more like, you know, like there's a lot of gray area. There's usually not as much black and white because if you do X, then, then Y happens. And if you do Y, then, you know, Z happens. And so it's just like, there's always sort of a juggling act of like, 
here's all the good things and here's all the negative things and which ones still have the most pull and that's you know so in your own you know mind you think about that like where what biases am I um, kind of possessing because of a lack of power or a feeling of having power you know it's, it's just very intriguing um, it's usually those whose poverty is relatively recent the new poor who throb with the fervent of frustration the memory of, of better things is as fire in their veins they are the disinherited and dispossessed who respond to every rising mass movement the present day working man in the Western world feels unemployment as a degradation. He sees himself um, disinherited and injured by an unjust order of things and is willing to listen to those who call for a new deal. He mentions that in like, like China, there's such a large population who have been poor for generations that, that that's not like a pain point. Of course, they would like to have more, but it, it's, it's it's normal, and so they, they don't feel like there's been some injustice, and we need to rise up. And so that he he frequently points to China as uh, an example of why you know certain mass movements haven't worked in China or haven't taken because the the people have sort of been in a stagnant place for a long time, a large number of people, um, where people toil for sunrise to sunset for a bare living. They nurse no grievance and dream no dreams. One of the reasons for the unrebellious of the masses in China is the inordinate effort required there to scrape together the means of a scantiest subsistence. The intensified struggle of existence is a static rather than a dynamic influence. Our frustration is greater when we have much and want more than when we have nothing and want some. Every established mass movement has its distant hope, its brand of dope to dole the impatience of the masses and reconcile with them their lot in life. Right? So you're 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 offering hope to the newly frustrated that this if you'll jump on my train and and take these principles, um, the future is bright for you, right? Now you have power again. Now it's not your fault. Now it's, it's the group that needs to succeed together. Freedom ag aggravates at least as much as it alleviates frustration. Freedom of choice places the whole blame of failure on the so shoulders of the individual. As a, and as freedom encourages a multiplicity of attempts, it unavoidably multiplies failure and frustration. Freedom alleviates frustration by making available the palliatives of uh, action, movement, change, and protest. We join a mass movement to escape individual responsibility or, in the words of the ardent young Nazi, to be free from freedom. To be free from freedom. Those who see their lives as spoiled and waste, uh, wasted crave equity and fraternity more than they do freedom. Um, I highlighted freaking every page. I'm just going to read this one and call it good, but I highlighted so much. We do not make people humble and meek when we show them their guilt and cause them to be ashamed of themselves. We are more likely to stir their arrogance and rouse in them a reckless aggressiveness. Self-righteousness is a loud din raised to drown the voice of guilt within. There is a guilty conscience behind every bra brazen word and act and behind every manifestation of self-righteousness. To do wrong, or let's see, to wrong those we hate is a is to add fuel to our hatred. Conversely, to treat an enemy with mag ma magnanimity is to blunt our hatred for them. He, uh, at one point, he mentioned that someone asked Hitler if he actually wanted the, you know, the Jews dead, and he said, he said something along the lines of, of no, because then we would have to manufacture an enemy, right? So he had he had so many different f facets on like. Okay, you're frustrated because of, you know, the poverty, because of this, that, and the other. Well, it's this enemy's fault, and he identified an enemy. So now he's hitting on their frustration, placing blame on these people, and saying, I'm the solution. Here it is. Follow me. And then he created ranks, right? And he, he had people reporting to one another and holding each other accountable for action. Um, 
and if you acted a certain way, you would be praised, and if you didn't, the punishments were were horrible, right? And so it was like the upside was was so much easier and better than to stand alone on the you know on the actual right side, right? On the, to stand alone for good, um, and so he hit all these different points. Um, a lot of like Christian leaders and like you know um, Gandhi, um, so many other leaders that that did great things use similar tactics. Touch on the frustration. Identify whose fault it was. I'm the solution, or here's your solution. Let's band together and go get it, right? And so, um, it's very interesting that there was always a man of words, you know, a very like uh, good good speaker, obviously not me, <laughs> and uh, who who could identify, you know, an enemy. He could identify the frustration that that enemy has caused, that it's not your fault, and it's us that's going to give us power back we're gonna we're gonna bring power back and that sort of um, that's a quick version he goes into so much detail on you know what the frustrations are and what the leader looks like and feels like and sounds like and um, how long a mass movement can last and why it, it eventually fails and you have to shift gears and and things like that and he, he hits a lot of different leaders across the world and things that they did and where they went wrong or right in in their mass movement so some of them couldn't ever shift gears and so it was the second leader that really um, took the the platform and made it something whereas the first leader was the one that kind of brought rise to the people and anger and right showed them their frustration right and and primed the the population for a mass movement and then a new leader would come in and sweep in and take it he also talks about this one was very interesting that um, like we'll use politics so you know there's left wing and right wing and then everyone in between well he says that the right wing is much more close to the extreme left wing than to someone in the middle there's just a different uh, set of things that, that they kind of hold fast to, right? And so if you can tweak those thoughts, you almost immediately have a convert to this side or that side, right? Um, because they're just, they're basically equally as passionate about certain things and right and wrong and have a type of thinking of like black and white versus the one in the middle that kind of goes, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know. You're not going to just convert that one to like an extremist. Also in religion, like if someone's already a extreme believer, whether they're a Christian or a Muslim or or uh, you know any other extreme religion, there's this uh, you know certain principles that they're holding on to, different names and and maybe traditions. But if you could tweak those, all of a sudden they're a Christian, right? But a non-believer or someone that goes, I, I believe a little, but I don't really know. I can't really define it. Man, that's a hard conversation. It's a hard conversion because they're, they're really so far away from like having this like deep desire to be a part of a religion and have you know, God control their life or whatever. Um, so I think that's really interesting that the one that's in the middle is actually the farthest from you know, the left or the right. Um, and so when you're targeting your mass movement right if you're an influencer on on facebook or instagram or whatever social media when you're defining your target look for people who are already you know really passionate about something sort of similar to yours and then you can sweep in and you know grab those people and and take them on your mass movement um so anyway true true believer Eric Hoffer, very interesting dude. He's written several books, and he actually didn't have any like real formal education other than I think elementary and high school maybe. But um, in the 1940s, Eric Hoffer wrote philosophical treaties, and man, so this is a pretty old book. Pretty, you know, he wrote it a long time ago, but he was a very smart guy. Um, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1983 and died later that year very interesting fella super interesting book full of great content I highlighted 
literally like every third page. So I, I definitely recommend this. I'll put the link below to Amazon if you want to purchase, you know, from here. That would be excellent, and I uh, hope you enjoy.